Hello everyone and welcome to this final session of um, Dynamic Cell 4. It's an absolute delight to welcome Ian Chambers, who is our Hook Medal winner for the British Society for Cell Biology for 2020. So actually we awarded this to Ian um, at the beginning of 2020, but we went straight into lockdown and very sadly, that meant we weren't able to award it to him last year in 2020 itself, which would be the normal situation. However, we're now finally awarding it to him and he is going to be sent the medal tomorrow, the real medal. Um, I'm just going to show you a picture at the end. So, um, Ian, the, the, the Hook Medal is the main medal for... Um, for the British Society of Cell Biology, which was the first medal that was designed and awarded a very long time ago. First, I was the very first awardee, so that tells you how old I am. Ian is, um, we were very delighted to award it to him because he's had an absolutely seminal career so far. Just to say it's awarded to someone who's been an independent group leader for up to 14 years. So Ian did his PhD at the Beetson Institute and then went to do a postdoc in Stanford. He returned to Edinburgh after that and um, was a postdoc with Austin Smith when he discovered Nanog, which is now one of the main uh, transcription factors that everyone looks at in uh, embryonic stem cells and in stem cell fate. And Ian discovered it and um, has done major work on NANOG to characterize it in stem cells. And indeed his work focuses on embryonic stem cell um, fate. He's been a group leader uh, in Edinburgh since 2006. And so uh, with no further ado, I'd like to get Ian to present his Hook Medal Award lecture. Oh, okay. Uh... Thanks very much, uh, Anne, for that kind of introduction. Um, uh, first of all, I, I'd like to uh, thank the BSCB committee for awarding me the uh, Hook Medal. <clears throat> this is a very great honour. Uh, and one that I'm very pleased about. I'd also like to thank uh, Harry Leach and Sally Lowell for uh, nominating me for this. Uh, awards like this are they're often the results of the efforts of uh, many uh, people, and that's certainly the case here. I'd therefore like to thank all the members of my lab, both past and present, for their contributions. This award is as much a recognition of their efforts as anyone else's. Um, so what I'm going to do today is I'll tell you a little bit about some key findings from the lab. I won't be able to uh, cover all of them and for that I apologise to uh, my colleagues for omitting their work. Anyway, I'll cover some key uh, published findings before going on to describe some of the strands of our current research and touching on a couple of our unpublished stories. <clears throat> so, this is the question that fascinates uh, many of us uh, and is one that you'll remember uh, hearing about um, from Agatha uh, during her talk yesterday. What controls uh, cell identity? How does this uh, one uh, fertilised egg develop into the many hundreds of uh, different uh, cell types that make up an adult uh, organism? Um, and specifically, uh, <clears throat> how do transcription factors control these changes in uh, cell identity? To approach this, uh, we're interested in uh, embryonic stem cells. These uh, cells have two uh, defining features. The first is their ability to undergo uh, unlimited uh, self-renewing divisions in which a uh, uh, mother cell divides to give uh, rise to identical uh, daughters in a process of self-renewal. 
And the other uh, cardinal property of these cells is their ability to uh, differentiate into all the types of cells uh, that make up uh, the embryo proper through each of the primary germ layers. So it's these two uh, features of self renewal and differentiation that make these cells uh, very interesting to many labs. Um, <clears throat> so the pluripotency is key. Cell identity can be changed simply by modifying uh, the cell uh, culture medium. Um, they can be grown in large numbers, and another advantage is that they're uh, relatively trivial to genetically uh, modify. And this has made them a focus of interest for many, many labs. Uh, most prominent uh, amongst these are uh, Austin Smith's lab and uh, Rick Young's lab. So this is the uh, question that uh, fascinated uh, me when I was a, a postdoc with Austin. Um, in order for ES cells to self-renew, we knew uh, from uh, previous uh, work from Austin Smith that leukemia inhibitory factor was the key molecule. And so what we wanted to ask was, were there any molecules in embryonic stem cells that uh, if we elevated their uh, level of expression, we're able to uh, circumvent this requirement for lift. So the way that we did this was to uh, prepare a cDNA library from embryonic stem cells and put that cDNA under the control of a, a strong promoter, transfect it into uh, embryonic stem cells and set up a screen to ask the question, can any cells uh, self-renew in the absence of any uh, signaling mediated by LIF? And of course, the answer is yes. Uh, we were able to isolate uh, colonies that looked like this, uh, grown in the absence of LIF. These are nice self-renewing uh, colonies, and these uh, colonies continue to express uh, OP4, which um, is uh, the key at the time was the key transcription factor that, that defined uh, embryonic stem cell identity. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we uh, identify, when we cloned this molecule, um, the fact that the phenotype was that the cells would uh, self-renew under conditions that uh, normally they would completely differentiate uh, made uh, me think of the uh, ancient Celtic mythological land of uh, the ever young Chirmanog, where visitors uh, are able to remain unaged for hundreds of years. So we named this uh, Jean Nanog after this uh, place. If we look in pre implantation embryos to see where Nanog is expressed, then uh, what you see here is the dark stain marks up uh, cells that have Nanog messenger RNA in them. And this very, very well uh, uh, marks the start and the end of uh, what is now referred to as naive pluripotency and which you heard about uh, from Agatha's talk yesterday. So unlike other transcription factors like COP4 and SOX2, uh, Nanog is not expressed in the uh, fertilised egg and comes on just at the time when pluripotency is being specified. And then uh, its levels peak and then decline so that uh, at implant, at just before implantation, when the epiblast has reached this uh, distinct phase of pluripotency called formative, uh, there is no longer any NROG uh, expressed. So later in development, the NOG is expressed in a couple of places. Uh, express, it's expressed in the proximal posterior region of the post-implantation epiblast, and it's also expressed in primordial germ cells. And I'll see a little bit more of those uh, later. So these are the uh, people that were involved in isolating the NOG. Morag Robertson is an excellent uh, molecular biology uh, technician and Dougie Colby is a cell culture aficionado. Uh, so this is uh, the team that isolated uh, Nanog in Edinburgh. 
Just to remind you, this is a defining feature of the NOG. Uh, well typed cells in the absence of lift will uh, uh, completely differentiate um, and express uh, endoderm and mesoderm uh, markers, whereas uh, cells that overexpress the NOG continue to uh, self renew. <clears throat> So this is interesting and it tells us something important and that is that uh, from the point of view of efficient embryonic stem cell self-renewal, well type levels of the NOG are suboptimal. In fact, if we look in uh, <clears throat> cultures of ESLs grown in fetal calf serum and lift, then what you see is that uh, the NOG protein is heterogeneously expressed uh, throughout the undifferentiated uh, cell colonies. So here you can see that uh, many of these uh, cells, um, almost all of these cells express ALK4, but only some of them express uh, NANOG. And concentration uh, dependent effects are not limited to uh, NANOG. Another key example is ALK4, and this is work uh, that was done uh, a while ago by Hitoshi Niwa, and this is really uh, quite a seminal piece of work uh, a landmark paper where modulating the levels of a single transcription factor can have quite distinct uh, outcomes. So if uh, OP4 level drops below a certain level, then the cells will differentiate into trophectoderm. But if the level of uh, OP4 is elevated above a particular point, then the cells will differentiate and express uh, <clears throat> markers of endoderm and mesoderm. And only if uh, OP4 concentration is kept within certain boundaries is pluripotency uh, maintained. So this is something that we were particularly interested in in my lab because we had some hints that there was uh, a relationship between all 4 and the NOC. And I'll illustrate that to you here uh, by immunofluorescence looking at well type embryonic stem cells. And this is the kind of uh, heterogeneous expression that I already uh, illustrated to you. So if we compare this with uh, ESLs, the OP4 level is reduced by deleting one of the OP4 alleles, then what you can see is the OP4 protein uh, levels decline. But the most remarkable thing here is that the uh, NANOG uh, expression becomes essentially homogeneous. So these NANOG low cells are pretty much eliminated from these cultures. And this is work that was carried out by uh, Vio Karvaski uh, in my lab. And when Vio looks at uh, ESLs, I plated uh, clonal density then and stains them to see whether they are undifferentiated or not. What you can see here is that some uh, colonies uh, form nice undifferentiated col uh, colonies like here. But there are other uh, colonies in the dish where there are some signs of differentiation at the periphery of colonies. And in fact, there are some colonies where the majority of cells appear to be differentiated. In contrast, the NOC4 heterozygotes, uh, almost all of the uh, colonies that form at these very high levels of LIF are undifferentiated. And if we titrate uh, LIF down, then uh, what you can see is that there's a decrease in the number of completely undifferentiated colonies with decreasing levels of LIF. That's true in well type cells. It's also true in OP4 heterozygotes, but you can also see that there's something like a 30 fold uh, hyper responsiveness uh, to the uh, LIF response in these OP4 heterozygotes. So amongst other things, what that tells us is that from the perspective of efficient embryonic stem cell self-renewal, the well type level of OP4 is also suboptimal. And there are other examples of this too. For example, my fibroblast growth factor is an OP4 SOPS2 target gene, um, and uh, it drives differentiation of ES cells. Um, <clears throat> So uh, what I'm doing here is coming back to this uh, model from uh, Hitoshi. Uh, the essential uh, message is, is unchanged, uh, but I think we can uh, put a little bit different uh, numbers on this because in well-type cultures, 
uh, we see differentiation. And from work from Jose Silva's lab, uh, he has shown that you can drop the uh, OP4 concentration uh, down to one sixth of the well tech level and the cells still retain pluripotency. <clears throat> So together, uh, these uh, observations on ESL self-renewal tell us that uh, the instructions for destabilizing the pluripotent cell state or the naive pluripotent cell state are hardwired into the pluripotency uh, gene regulatory network. And I began to mention this earlier when I was talking about FGF4, a target gene of the OP4 SOX2 uh, transcription factors that drives differentiation of uh, ESLs. And inhibition of uh, FGF4 signaling is uh, part of the uh, 2i uh, cocktail that Austin's lab have developed for uh, general uh, culture of ES cells in the night state. So in lifting FCS, the NOG is expressed heterogeneously and we know that uh, cells express in high levels of the NOG self new well and cells that express low levels of the NOG uh, have an increased differentiation propensity. So this leads us to two questions. What partner proteins allow the NOG to work? And what are the target genes through which the NOG acts? So we have approached this uh, by doing affinity purification and mass spectrometry of the NOG. And when we do this, we can identify uh, over 100 uh, proteins that bind um, the NOG. And we're continuing to uh, characterize um, these interactions using mutant NANOG uh, variants. And one of these, I'm just going to mention one of these that's here. This is the wild type NANOG. And it's a small uh, protein of 305 amino acids. It has a DNA binding homeodomain here. And the other region that's of interest is this uh, tryptophan repeat region. It's some low complexity domain that has 10 tryptophan uh, residues spaced evenly every five amino acids uh, apart. And if we mutate these tryptophans to alanines, we can uh, make a mutant that uh, no longer possesses the defining uh, ability of the NOG to confer uh, lift independent self renewal. Um, so, one of the things that we're doing is asking what proteins interact through the tryptophan repeat and how do these proteins deliver the NOG function? The second uh, question that I raised was, uh, what are the uh, genes through which the NOG acts? And so we've addressed this by uh, looking for direct target genes uh, using uh, ES cells in which both of the NOG alleles are deleted and in which the NOG activity is delivered by uh, ubiquitously expressed uh, transgene uh, encoding a fusion protein between the NOG and a mutant form of estrogen receptor. This uh, mutant estrogen receptor allows us to uh, relocalize the NOG activity from the cytoplasm uh, to the nucleus in a matter of minutes and then measure uh, changes in gene transcription. So we already knew uh, from work from uh, Stuart Orkin's lab in Boston and uh, Happy Ng's lab in Singapore, that there were uh, <clears throat> in excess of 6,000 sites in the genome to which the NOG bound. However, when we uh, modulate uh, the NOG expression in these cells, we find uh, that uh, the vast majority of these binding sites aren't associated with any changes in uh, gene expression, and rather there's uh, hundreds of uh, genes that only that change in transcription. Some go up, some go down. And I highlighted here is one of these uh, prominently upregulated uh, targets, which is also a transcription factor that's part of the naive pluripotency gene regulatory network, estrogen receptor related uh, receptor B. This raises some questions. Why only 100? And we don't know the answer to this yet. And how do NANOG domains contribute to uh, gene control? And so this second part is something that uh, Matusz Wojciech in the lab is uh, addressing. So he's doing this using uh, a mutant 
and all proteins that are uh, linked to the estrogen receptor and expressing these in an inaugural background. So he's doing this <clears throat> with a couple of different mutants. One is in the tryptophan repeat, uh, including this uh, tryptophan to alanine mutant, where Nanog can no longer bind to some of its partners that uh, require this interaction. And the second is a single point mutation within the homeo domain that abolishes the ability of Nanog to bind to DNA, but that otherwise leaves partner protein interactions okay. So we can use tamoxifen to move uh, the NOG into the nucleus and then at various times after that, I can measure RNA or can measure chromatin interactions for the NOG PUL2 or 4 such 2 And I'll, I'm just going to show you some of this stuff. So this uh, shows you changes in gene expression. You can see that relative to well type, both the tryptophan repeat and the homeo domain are required for a uh, prominent uh, to prominently and efficiently regulate gene expression. This is the output from uh, CHIP uh, data using a uh, well type uh, NANOG or the tryptophan mutant NANOG or the uh, homeo domain mutant. And what you can see is that the vast majority of uh, NANOG uh, interactions with chromatin require uh, intact tryptophan repeat. Uh, but not all of them. About a third uh, can still interact with uh, chromatin in the absence of uh, tryptophan repeat interactions. And quite surprisingly, about 10% of uh, anog binding sites are totally unaffected by uh, abolition of direct DNA binding. And if you look at the uh, strength of occupancy, uh, as shown here in these uh, uh, data outputs, what you can see is that <clears throat> these, this is the binding to this um, blue section here where only wild type binds and you can see that there's a significant diminution in binding of the other mutants. But you can also see uh, here, for example, in this uh, N51A binding uh, uh, segment, that the highest occupancy sites are ones that don't require direct DNA binding. So that's quite interesting and we know from uh, other uh, CHIP studies with OP4 and other proteins, that uh, these are the places where there is high density of interaction of other pluripotency uh, transcription factors. <clears throat> and one other thing that uh, Matish has uh, looked at is by doing transient uh, labeling of cells to uh, map uh, enhancer RNAs in the vicinity of differentially expressed genes. Uh, <clears throat> and when he does that and looks uh, at down-regulated or up-regulated uh, uh, genes for changes in uh, eRNA nearby, then what you can see is that with wild type, there's a strong decrease in eRNAs at down-regulated uh, genes and a moderate increase in eRNA synthesis at up-regulated genes. And that in both cases, uh, these changes are totally wiped out uh, when the DNA binding uh, mutant is induced. Uh, but when the tryptophan repeat uh, mutant is induced, the level of uh, alteration is uh, intermediate. So we're pursuing uh, these uh, findings at the moment. One of the other things that was quite uh, gratifying uh, was when uh, Matush uh, came to the office and uh, talked to me about uh, the uh, GO uh, terms associated with the differentially expressed uh, genes. Uh, and, and what he was uh, able to show was that by far and away, the uh, highest GO term was uh, associated with uh, cell responses to uh, LIF. <clears throat> So I want to switch gear now and uh, talk a little bit about um, ESRB, this positively regulated uh, target gene that I mentioned previously. So this is uh, a summary of some work that I, Man Jiang in my lab did with uh, Harry Leach uh, when Harry was uh, a PhD student with uh, Azim Surani and Austin Smith. 
And what uh, we did was uh, <clears throat> make a germline deletion of the NOG. And in contrast to the situation in, uh, in uh, genital ridges where the NOG is normally expressed, when you take out the NOG uh, genes at the onset of uh, germline development, then what you see is that in mid gestation, there's a reduced number of PGCs. PGCs are not absent, but they are reduced in number. We uh, then uh, did an experiment where we crossed uh, mice with a, a line in which ESRB was knocked into the nanoglucus. And we did that. When we did that, we were able to fully rescue uh, <clears throat> PGC uh, development uh, resulting from a loss of the nanog. So that's, that's what was published a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, we also looked at uh, a negatively regulated in the NOG target gene by OTX2. <clears throat> so this is this here uh, summarizes work from a uh, paper uh, that uh, was largely the work of Man Zhang and Jing Chao Zhang in my lab, uh, but was done in collaboration with Antonio Simeone's lab in uh, Naples. And what uh, we were able to show that is that ESLs uh, move from this naive pluripotent state through a formative state and then can either enter a primed pluripotent state, in which case they will then go on to uh, differentiate into somatic lineages, or they can progress uh, into the germline. <clears throat> and this formative state here is defined by uh, the highest levels of OTX2 expression. And if we did this, uh, <clears throat> differentiation towards the uh, germline. In OTX2 null ES cells, then we got an exceptionally high uh, efficiency of germline differentiation in more than 85%, uh, which compares with the uh, well type efficiencies uh, at the same time of around about 30%. If on the other hand, we did an experiment where we a prolonged expression of OTX2 at this point in time, then we could completely wipe out any differentiation into the germline. And so OTX2 acts as a, uh, as a traffic cop to direct uh, um, <coughs> cells into uh, prime pluripotency. So uh, um, Antonio's lab have uh, carried this work forward and Luca uh, Di Giovantonio uh, has uh, made some deletions of OTX2 uh, binding sites at the Nanog locus and at the OPT4 locus. And this is really interesting because this tells us uh, that um, these uh, binding sites principally at the Nanog and OPT4 uh, are responsible for the OTX2 mediated block to uh, PGC development. Uh, and that the and that OTX2 acts by in large part by repressing transcription of the organ OP4. So if we uh, enforce OTX2 expression in cells where OTX2 is no longer able to bind to an org, then instead of us getting 0% into the germline, we get uh, more than 50% of cells moving into the germline. So a summary of these, uh, <clears throat> of what I've said so far is that uh, Nanog is off during the peri-implantation formative phase. When Nanog becomes re-expressed, uh, uh, that re-expression happens in a new cell context and that when that happens, the NOG is repurposed uh, to act during uh, primordial germ cell specification. And additional experiments suggest that there may be a further repurposing of the NOG uh, during gastrulation. I'll just uh, end by telling you uh, why we think that's the case. So this is work that I uh, we did, we've done in collaboration with uh, Val Wilson's lab here, uh, uh, the CRM in Edinburgh. And some time ago, we were able to show that uh, pluripotency 
is uh, completely lost in the embryo at the point at which cell lines form. And this uh, summarizes our uh, thinking uh, at the time. The pluripotency network activity diminishes with time and it drops below some critical level at the point of uh, onset of somatogenesis. And at this point, tissue dissected from these embryos does not form pterocarcinomas and is not capable of uh, giving rise to pluripotent uh, cells when placed in culture, unless OPT4 is uh, artificially increased in its expression, in which case pluripotency can be rescued. <clears throat> so, Freddie uh, Wong and Man Zhang in my lab uh, asked this question, uh, is pluripotency first uh, lost uh, regionally? Freddie, so Man Zhang's a postdoc uh, with me, and Freddie was a joint uh, PhD student uh, with Val Wilson. And what Freddie did was uh, stain up some embryos uh, for SOX2, and you can see the red here shows the levels of SOX2. And this uh, proximal posterior region of the epiblast has the lowest level of uh, SOX2 in it. And Freddie uh, chopped this little piece off and then did tertocarcinoma assays and also did uh, epi stem cell culture establishment assays. And when he did that, what he found was that in contrast to normal tissue from here, uh, this proximal posterior epiblast tissue had no ability to give tertocarcinomas and also it had no ability to give rise to epi stem cells in culture which says that by two separate criteria, this region is not pluripotent. <clears throat> now, unlike the situation that I described earlier, uh, at the later somatogenesis stage, artificially raising the OPT4 expression uh, in these uh, proximal posterior epiblast explants does not rescue pluripotency. However, raising the level of SOX2 does this. <clears throat> and if we look at the levels of transcription factor protein expression in the pre-streak embryo at the time that we're uh, uh, discussing here, then what you can see is that this is the point uh, when the NOG uh, becomes re-expressed. Remember I told you earlier that at the formative peri-implantation state stage the NOG is off. Uh, when it comes back on, it comes back on here and it comes on in cells where the SOX2 uh, protein level is diminishing and both of these things are happening at a time before there's any uh, brachiuri expression. Brachiuri would be marking incipient uh, mesoderm. So this uh, made us wonder could the NOG be repressing SOX2? Quite a radical idea. So uh, we I set up this mouse cross. This is a, a Cree deleter, which adds peri-implantation. Uh, and we cross this with uh, LOX P flanked uh, the NOG uh, allele present on both. Uh, copies of this mouse uh, and then we can get uh, the NOG mutants and when we look at, when Freddie looks at these this is what he sees. In heterozygote cells where the NOG is still expressed uh, sections show that SOX2 protein is lost from the prox proximal posterior uh, epiblast uh, prior to ingression through the streak and uh, that mesoderm is negative for SOX2. In contrast, uh, embryos that are deleted for an ANOG continue to express SOX2, uh, not only in cells as they move through the streak, but also in nascent mesoderm. <clears throat> so the model here is that uh, 
nodal, the nodal field in the proximal posterior portion of the embryo um, <clears throat> is restricted by inhibitors coming from the anterior visceral endoderm and nodal acts upstream of the NOG. And the NOG uh, acts, we think, in synergy with wind signaling to uh, suppress SOX2. So that's uh, everything that I want to say uh, today. Um, this is a picture of our lab. Uh, it was taken uh, what seems like a very long time ago, but probably uh, since then uh, I have been to the pub twice. Uh, this is uh, Elisa Barbieri and this is when we were uh, welcoming her to the lab. Uh, this is Matish Wojciech, whose work I described to you, uh, and Nick Mullen, who's working on the uh, tryptophan uh, repeat. These are the current members of my lab, past members of my lab. I want to thank a whole bunch of uh, collaborators, only some of whom I've been able to uh, discuss uh, their work uh, today. Also, I want to uh, say a special thank you to uh, some other people, uh, Austin uh, Smith, um, for uh, allowing me to do some pretty risky experiments while I was in his lab and for uh, being patient when many of those experiments um, uh, weren't quite as successful as we had hoped. And other people that I want to uh, thank for their patience and for their support are my wife Helen and my boys Jack and Stephen, as well as uh, the extended um, members of the Chambers family who've been a big support to me over the years. Um, I also need to thank uh, our funders and maybe give a shout out to say that we have some uh, postdocs post positions open. Um, and I want to thank you for uh, your attention and uh, I'll take any questions now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian, for a fantastic talk that covered so much um, really important information that you've discovered over the many years, which was why we awarded you the prize, of course. <laughs> so thank you very much. And for explaining the um, derivation of NANOG, which now I know how to pronounce as well, which is based on the Gaelic, so thank you. So I'm just gonna um, start by looking at the questions. Um, so uh, the first question that we have is, could the NANOG null background explain why so few genes are upregulated when induced with ERT? Could this be uh, because of epigenetic differences? Uh, prior when, when that has been deleted? Uh, the, that is, uh, we can't rule that out. Uh, that's a possibility. And uh, other uh, labs um, have uh, found slightly different things. So for example, uh, um, Pablo Navarra's lab in uh, Paris uh, have uh, done their experiments in a slightly different way and find a different uh, uh, set of genes. Um, but in those cases, uh, they're going from uh, wild type uh, levels and then uh, increasing above that. Uh, so the numbers of uh, genes are likely to uh, be different, um, at least partly because of concentration dependent effects. Certainly those concentration dependent effects uh, can't be ruled out and we do know that uh, concentration is important here. Uh, so um, at the moment uh, it's not possible to say answer that question uh, definitively um, but uh, I'm not sure that it's necessary to invoke it. Uh, there are other examples where uh, transcription factors uh, um, target only a subset of uh, genes associated with the binding sites. So it's not as though this is a completely unexpected thing. Okay, great. I, I was very interested actually in your tryptophans, in your tryptophan rich domain and the very, reg uh, very regular tryptophans. And then when you uh, mutate them, then you get a very different um, function. 
so do you know any more about what binds to those domains and whether um, it affects even nanolocalization in the nucleus, for example? Uh, we don't know. Uh, now, that's a good question. Uh, uh, yeah, we don't know whether uh, sub -cell, sub nuclear localization is affected. Uh, we do know that uh, there are uh, differences um, in how the tryptophan repeat uh, functions depending depending upon the spacing between the tryptophans. Uh, so we've already published some work that uh, looks at uh, reducing the, the number of tryptophans within the tryptophan repeat. And it seems like if you go below seven, there's 10 in the well type molecule. If you go below seven, then uh, an odd function is strongly impaired. Uh, but we've done other things. We've moved the spacing between the tryptophans to increase it and decrease it. Uh, we have uh, a reasonable amount of uh, data um, that uh, is going to be a little while uh, before we are ready to publish. Um, but it certainly looks like uh, five is optimal. Um, however, there are other features of the tryptophan repeat that uh, make us think that the well type uh, tryptophan repeat is is uh, not uh, optimally configured. You know, I mentioned uh, the concentration of transcription factors as being a suboptimal uh, thing in ES cells, and it would appear that uh, not only concentrations are suboptimal, but also uh, domain structures may also be um, suboptimal. And they're suboptimal for a very good reason, and that is that it's easier to um, interfere with their uh, functionality if they don't work brilliantly. Okay, very interesting. Thank you. Um, so, um, we have another question. Does NANOG exist in invertebrates? And if not, why might there have been a change in the mechanism for controlling stem cell behaviour? <laughs> uh, uh, good uh, question. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, NANOG uh, exists uh, in... Um, avians and reptiles, not in invertebrates. Uh, and so it would appear that it's part of a, a particular um, form of uh, cellular control. Uh, and um, not only is it not uh, present in all species, uh, it's also quite uh, variable in its uh, structure outside the DNA binding domain in uh, those species in which it is uh, um, expressed. And at the moment, we don't really know uh, very much about uh, what that means. There's, there's, it's just a big black hole. I'm sorry, not to be able to take in that. Okay. And, um... It, it, for example, are the, are the domains conserved completely between all the species? No, they're not. No, they're not. So um, the tryptophan repeat, for example, uh, is a variable length in uh, mammals. Uh, it's slightly longer in rats, slightly shorter in uh, humans. Um, and the spacing uh, between the tryptophans is... Uh, is conserved even down to uh, a possum, where I think there are only two or three tryptophans, but there's still uh, five residues apart. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that pro probably means that uh, the nog molecules in different uh, species are able to interact with uh, different proteins. And so the function of different nog molecules uh, may be uh, tuned to uh, specific species requirements. Um, the time of uh, expression of the NOG um, uh, coincides with uh, naive pluripotency and that is variable uh, between species. Okay, but there could be some different functions for sure. Yeah. Even different genes regulated, for example. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Ian, for um, answering those questions and um, spending the time with us. I'm just going to quickly share um, my um, slides. Um,
This is a hook medal. <laughs> Here we are. Here's Hook's um, original microscope and what he saw down it, which was plant cells. Um, and this is the design of the medal you're going to receive in the post. <laughs> So um, congratulations, Ian, on behalf of the British Society for Cell Biology, um, from me, the president, and from all the committee. And um, thank you very much for your fantastic talk. And um, here's a, a picture of the medal, which is absolutely lovely. So I hope you enjoy it. I've got one on. <laughs> Here you go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's very so, and it's still the same, so it hasn't changed. Yeah. I I'm looking forward that. to this that Thank you. So congratulations, Ian, and um, I hope you enjoy uh, treasuring the medal as much as I do. And thank you. Thanks so much.